Welcome back to A Little Faith. This is a podcast sponsored by the Williamsburg Christadelphian Foundation. A Little Faith podcast explores both the challenges and hope of living a life of faith. One of our hosts, Steve Johnson, convened a group of Christadelphians from around the world to discuss how the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded, as well as consider the issues of faith that have arisen or may yet arise. The video of this discussion can also be viewed on our website. If there are issues or questions you'd like to see our Global Faith panel discuss, please email thoughts at wcfoundation.org. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this roundtable discussion about the uh, pandemic that uh, we're all involved in at this point. Uh, First thing you do when you try to pull together a group from around the world is you print out a time chart of time zones around the world. And then you try to figure out when people are up at a reasonable time. Uh, so we have Tim Galbraith in Hyderabad, India, Karim Ram in Birmingham, England, uh, Kyle Tucker in Sutherland, Virginia, that's near Richmond, if you're trying to picture this in your mind's eye. Janice Manson is in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. That's close to right down the road from Toronto. Sarah Joyner is joining us from Portland, Oregon. And sorry about that sort of joining and joining. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm Steve Johnson, and I'm in Bloomington, Illinois, which is a couple hours south of Chicago. Uh, here's my purpose in doing this um, for anybody who tunes in and, and watches this, um, is to bring reassurance to people during this time, because there's a lot of anxiety right now. Uh, And my first question to throw out is, is this possible to be reassured under the circumstances? Well, to start off, uh, I'd say yes, because we we need to look at biblical examples. We've got somebody like Isaiah who lived at a terrible anxious time. The, The northern kingdom and the Syrians were invading, the Assyrians were threatening, and everybody was totally scared. And Isaiah himself became scared. That's clear from Isaiah chapter 8. And so Isaiah says that the Lord called hold of me. He grabbed my arm and he says, don't be carried away with the the rumors that are going around. Everybody's saying, confederacy, confederacy, what are we going to do? And actually he he says um, these words, or God says, sanctify the Lord God of hosts. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Don't join the people and say, oh, a confederacy, confederacy. So I, I think the Bible tells us that we, we have the blessing of, a, of another perspective um, that, we, that the world doesn't have. Yeah, and their perspective is hope, basically, that there's something sure beyond it. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I, I, in response to one of, your, um, one of the questions you sent through, Steve, what faith lessons can we learn from this? Um, I think that we're um, addicted as a society and as a culture to the, to the opiate of control. Uh, we think that we have the right to and can control uh, every aspect of our, of our lives, um, that we can remove uncertainty from our lives. And I think James warns us of that, of that mindset when we should say God willing when we speak um, and that our lives are contingent on God. Um, so this is all very interesting because this is like a modern Tower of Babel um, that's being challenged. Um, and so the current situation in some way could be viewed as a blessing. Um, the death of God, inverted commas, um, has gone hand in hand with modernity, with this ideology of progress and certainty. But who could have believed just a few months ago that something invisible would dramatically bring to a halt all that we take for granted uh, in our modern world? So I'm glad that our, that our attitude of, of hubris is being challenged um, because it shows us there are actually more things in heaven and earth um, and that we don't have an inalienable right to trash the planet. Um, at times like this, particularly if we're young, our faith, our view of the world can be really challenged. Um, it can feel really small. Um, if there really is a God, you know, why is he or she uh, allowing this to happen? Well, God never promised us a life without problems, but he does offer us resilience if we choose to build on the rock of Jesus' life and teaching. And I think that's an important thing. God didn't promise us a life without problems. Mm. 
Yeah, I think the perspective, sorry to jump in again, too, is we have we live in a world of information technology where we are getting flooded with what's happening around the world and we're flooded with the idea that now there are 28,000 deaths because of this virus. Um, what we tend to forget is back in 1918, there was 50 million deaths because of the flu virus. In my lifetime, 1957, we had 1.1 million deaths. In 1968, we had 2 million deaths. Um, and But we didn't hear so much about all that because we didn't know. But now we've got information technology. Everything is swamping in on us, and, and that's where we have to be careful mm. that it doesn't push the word of God out of, and the hope that we have out of our um, thinking, out of our consciousness. Mm-hmm. You know, the Internet and uh, communication the way it is and what we're doing, it just makes things, magnifies some of the news or some of what's going on a bit. I think it's what you, you're you saying. It, it just seems bigger because we're so immediately involved <laughs> if we're watching uh, the news. and keep, yeah. So what one thing is, has uh, any of the other three folks uh, who haven't spoken yet, what, what have you learned from this so far regarding faith, faith lessons? We get so languishing in our decadence and our uh, daily lives that we forget to turn back to practicing our faith, to executing what God has given us. You know, Karam's mentioned our, well, actually, I guess Tim mentioned our intelligence. We have intelligence to call up, to to take a challenge and develop more skills to get active, uh, to be productive, because we do languish in our, you know, in our pleasures of you know, materialism. So I think, I don't know, I guess I don't say I'm excited, but I certainly am uh, charged, I guess, by this event. If I um, exercise public confession a bit, um, you know, I've been very much, I think, at peace with the epidemic and that God is in control and, and that, uh, that God knows what he's doing. And it's given me a peace that uh, I haven't been scared. Um, but as I was uh, sharing with you before we got on, um, my problem has been anger. I've been finding myself getting angry at the politicians who are not responding or not responding appropriately. And um, I've really had to check myself. I, I don't usually get too worked up or angry about, you know, what goes on in the world of the world of politics. But uh, my daughter um, is a physician. Uh, she's on the front lines um, of this. She's an internal medicine physician. And uh, she's been given one mask uh, for this epidemic. That's all she has. And uh, it's going to be working roughly 80 hours a week or more um, in this hospital with these. Uh, they already have 200 uh, patients in their system right now. And I find myself getting angry at that. And and, and so I've had to kind of check myself and, and look and, and, and realize that, um, you know, this world and the, the politics of this world have always been corrupt and they've always been um, uh, taken the, the wrong stance. You know, neither uh, political party in the United States or any of the political parties in this world have the answer to this world's problems. You know, God has the answers. And it's, I've had to uh, kind of do some self-evaluation, check myself in that area, um, you know, because I, I think that shows a weakness in my own faith to get to get upset in, in that way. I think um, a lot of people are angry, Kyle. Um, I was with a group of um, people who are not Christadelphians, uh, um, members of a book club that I'm part of. Many of them are over 70. And I think they regard some of the discussion that's been going on in the UK about, you know, that balance between trying to preserve the economy and lives as being really, really sort of um, troubling. Um, and even today on, on the radio, they were talking about whether we should simply allow people over 70 um, you know, to die uh, in order to protect the economy. So, yeah, a lot of people are angry about it. I think we need to be really careful as to what we say in response to this sort of thing. I was very careful because I asked my opinion and I really actually didn't say anything. Um, you know, I just kept it. I thought the truth, you can't handle the truth. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, we, we need to be very aware um, and very sensitive to the way that people in the world are thinking about this at the moment. Mm -hmm. What faith lessons uh, can we learn? Um, Before um, showing up on the video call today, I posted some of these questions on some of the um, discussion forums that I'm on. 
And in answer to that question about faith lessons, one person said, I think we need to be careful of ascribing faith lessons when we're in the middle of an epidemic. We don't know what it's going to be like to live through it all, and many people are just in a state of shock and coping day to day, let alone reaching new heights of faith. So we need to be aware that people will experience the pandemic very differently. Some of us will be secure, secure in our work, a warm house, internet, and with a garden um, to take a, a breather in. And it's very different from someone who's lost their job, children who have lost their meals and education at school, people in abusive relationships. So um, faith lessons, people might say, well, I've had more time to pray, read the Bible and so on. But that kind of feels shallow to folks who really are frightened, I I would say, and perhaps in quite a, a different position than some of us. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for that perspective uh, and, and a little bit of, of a shift on that question because I think you're, you're absolutely right. I just got a, a text from a brother in Haiti this morning saying to the effect that this is, you know, do, do I think this is, that God made this happen to the world? Is this punishment of some sort? And I, I've seen a lot of that on the Facebook posts and that sort of thing. So what's the answer to that? Is this, is this God's punishment for something, some way? And, and how do we speak to somebody who feels that way? My father, he's, he's 89. He asked me that very question the other day. And I said, of course, this is from God. And I said, it's probably something you did. Um, <laughs> and he, he, he got a good chuckle out of that. But, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of different theories about God. But, but I find, um, you know, to me, it's inconceivable to think that God is not involved in this. Um, and, and that gives me comfort. Um, it doesn't make the situation any different than it is, but it gives me comfort to think that um, this is not just random. It's not just chance that there is a, a loving heavenly father that has a plan that all wants us, you know, come to a knowledge of his son and to be saved that's in charge of this. And um, so uh, my understanding of who God is, it's to me, it's kind of inconceivable that he's not mm-hmm. in this. But it's not necessarily okay, I, a punishment. It doesn't follow that it's necessarily a punishment. It, it could be just him working out his plan. I think that's that's important to distinguish because there are times when God directly says that he punishes, has, has punished, but many times he uses what naturally occurring things in his purpose. He, he's in control. Um, and so he, the Assyrians happen to be a wicked, cruel people. He doesn't make them a wicked, cruel people, but they are that. And so he uses that as an instrument in his purpose. Um, so this virus is not necessarily created by God. God deliberately set up this virus, but this virus being there, God uses that for his purposes. And I totally agree with your point that chance doesn't enter into it. People who quote the verse from Ecclesiastes, time and chance happens to everybody, therefore you're in an insecure world. Uh, I think that's wrong. Um, In Ecclesiastes, that means an event of death. It's not talking about lottery. And, you know, if I thought we had a world where God was not in control, I'd be scared to get out of bed every morning. That's my security, that everything is in the hand of God. Not that he personally does everything, but within his control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that, Tim. God's in control, but uh, is this virus a punishment of God? Well, my feeling is no, no, no it's I... not. But um, who, who knows the mind of God at the end of the day? But um, that would lead you down a path of saying, well, if I have a common cold, is that some sort of punishment from God? If I have a terminal illness, is that a punishment from God? And I don't think that, that it is. Um, <clears throat> remember in, um, I think it's round about John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Yep. Where there's a man born blind and the disciples have this similar mentality. Well, why is he blind? Was it something that he did? Or was it something that his parents did? Who's to blame? And Jesus said, no, it's not like that. Um, this is so that you'll be able to see uh, the glory of God. But the basic point is, no, this isn't a punishment. 
Um, so I think his teaching is quite clear on that one. And I, I would say, no, yes, God's in control, but this virus, in my mind, isn't a punishment. Um, my understanding is that it, it came from um, a marketplace where bats were being sold and, and the meat was um, contaminated. So that's the stem. I don't think God caused that to happen. He's in control of worldwide events, though. I, I tried to make that point, that, um, that, but that thing, therefore, existing, once the virus has come into the world, God can use that as a tool for the instrument of his children to build our faith or whatever it might be. Um, God did not cause wicked people to um, kill Jesus. Um, th that was something that they did of their own accord. Jesus did. God didn't do that. But he used that, seeing it was happening anyway, for his purpose. God's so brilliant, he can bring even the wickedness of man and make a positive out of it. But he doesn't do it. Janice, you were about to say something. Well, I, I agree with um, everyone. I think the difference is in vocabulary. Um, is it a punishment or is it, in fact, punishing, meaning we feel the effects of the virus and it's punishing, as Sarah mentioned earlier with her examples. Um, and the call is, what do we do? What is our response to such punishing uh, feelings that we have and how we respond both outwardly and inwardly? As Kyle said to his anger, how do we respond to, um, to manage our anger uh, through politics, perhaps? And, of course, through our reaching out to other people. So I think it's just a manage of vocabulary between what is punishment and what is actually our response to the punishing feelings we have. Uh, my, my own feeling, um, Steve, is that um, I, I would definitely sort of come down on saying that uh, I, I don't think that this is a punishment as such, but it is the consequence of human folly and human hubris, and God has allowed it. Um, there's a passage, isn't there, which talks about, you know, God giving them over to their own desires. And if we live in a world where humans are allowed to exercise free will, then, you know, perhaps that shouldn't surprise us. Mm -hmm. And maybe the style of life that we've developed in this 21st century is really not what God had in mind. You know, I think about that. Every once, if everybody was still living in their tent someplace, uh, probably impractical, but um, like Abraham and company or whatever, then they'd be socially distanced anyway. It'd be whatever. It's a, it's because we travel so much and whatever, but that's the way our world is. So, not, oh, I don't know what you can do about that. Um, we, Steve, we kind of we kind of put value judgments on these things, right? I mean, we look at the the the, the economic success of the you know last few years and uh, as, uh, as perhaps God's blessing, but maybe that was a curse in itself. Maybe that was a punishment. You know, we we don't know. Um, uh, necessarily what good things are going to come out of this virus. And um, I think a lot of it is just how you react to it and, and, and take the opportunity to um, to find the good and to find the way, you know, we can maybe uh, cultivate better relationships by helping people during this virus and uh, show them the love of Christ in the way that we react. Or maybe that the peace that we have um, because of our faith might encourage other people. So you just don't know. And it's, it's kind of dangerous to to put labels on things as good or bad um, mm -hmm. when when you're in the middle of them. Mm -hmm. I'd like to jump in on that word good because uh, living in India, people from often say to me, oh, Australia must be such a blessed country. You know, everybody's so materially well off it is a blessed country. Right. And I say, what do you define as a blessing? Yeah. Um, a blessing surely, truly for God's children is anything that brings you closer to Jesus, closer to God and the kingdom. And, and that may be a very different thing from what the world thinks of as, you know, material blessing. So I say, no, Australia is not a blessed country in, in that regard because mm -hmm. um, of, of their materialism. So um, Jesus um, talks about this when he talks about prayer and he says, how much more shall your heavenly father give good things to them that ask him? He, he, he um, defines what he means by ask and it'll be given to you. You, you talk about this in another question. Um, seek and you'll find, you know, answer to prayer. But Jesus clearly says, how much more shall your heavenly father give good things to them that ask him? And what are the good things? The things that are going to bring us closer to God. Mm -hmm. Nothing else can be defined as a blessing from my perspective.
Yeah, I think just going back, not to to revisit the faith lesson uh, question, but the faith lesson idea, and Sarah, you made a good point about this, and what just occurred to me now is, really, it's too early to say, here, I've learned this lesson, but what we can evaluate all the time, which I think I found myself doing, because my family's here, my grandchildren are not at school, life has changed. Now I'm looking at it, and maybe we all have the opportunity to look at our lives, slow down a little bit and say, what what can I pull out of this? What should I be doing? What, what reevaluate my priorities in life? You know, take take a breather. And you know, in in all of this, uh, in viewing anything positively, I just have to note that this is you know we're aware of the fact that many people are dying and there are many families suffering around the world. So when you talk about positive, I don't want to sound glib at all, but for individuals and as we go about, it seems like we have a chance to reevaluate at this point, take stock of where our faith is at and what we, what the things, I think what we've just been talking about, what's valuable really as believers to us. Um, And maybe pull back and stop being so much a part of our culture (laughs) that we are, that we live in, the world that we live in, the things we look for. One of the things that's happened over here is that we're learning to value people. Um, Key workers are the people who are considered to be people without skills. They're the people who work in supermarkets, people who drive lorries, people who collect rubbish, people who deliver our post and clean our offices. One of the things, one of the lessons in that sense is that where, you know, things, the value that we place on things, all of that is being turned upside down. Um, And in my mind, it's, we're moving more towards a situation a bit like the Sermon on the Mount, where, you know, um, it's, it's, it's the, the poor in spirits, it's the humble, you know, um, you know, these are the people that, that, that we're learning to value in that sense. Um, one of the things about COVID-19 is that it doesn't discriminate between Boris Johnson and, uh, and anybody else. You know, you know every, it's, it, it levels us all out, doesn't it? You know, so, um, but I do think, going back to my first point, I do think that we've taken the idea that we are in control of our lives for granted. And I think for the first time, we've realized that we're not. Yeah, and that is a good lesson. Um, can I throw this one out, uh, which is when I asked another brother uh, for questions, he wanted to put it a different way, but I, for my own reasons, wanted to leave it just the way I had it. Maybe I'll tell you the well what he suggested uh, that I change it, but it's this, uh, what should our response be if prayers don't seem to be answered? And this goes beyond the, the current virus situation, but it's just as a matter of life. But I know there's a lot of praying going on uh, in this world. World, um, by not just, uh, you know, Chris Adolphins, by believers of all sorts. And by, I remember once a quote, there are no uh, atheists in a lifeboat, uh, is a quote. So I'm uh, sure there are a lot of people who are, kind of, you know, reaching out, praying to God. But anyway, back to the question, what should our response be in life if prayers don't seem to be answered? And and here's how I was corrected by that brother who said, you should say, our prayers are always answered. And my response was, or the Bible tells us, or whatever, and I said, "Well, are you know, demonstrate that." I'm just curious how how you go about supporting that idea. You covered his his change by saying, um, "Seem not to be answered." Okay. You're not that they're not that you are saying from our perspective, God is not hearing, God is not responding the way way we want. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I think that very often that needs a, a revaluation of what are we asking for. Um, James talks about the fact that prayers are not heard when you ask for things for your material comfort, for what what, what you you want. Um, but uh, I, I just this afternoon I was watching the video of the of the sleepers, um, sleepers, whatever, from South Africa mm-hmm. who lost their child. Right. And um, talking to Lucas and Leona, they would say their prayers were answered, but they were not given their child. Yeah. <clears throat> and who answers the prayers? And we often want, again, back to that idea of passivity. We want to sit back and wait for things to happen. Uh, I think, again, we pray for character, for strength and for action so that we put people's prayers into action. We're the missionaries of Jesus. What are we doing waiting around for things to happen? No, we put the prayers into action. 
Mm-hmm. It's our responsibility to uh, be advocates of people's prayers. The people that Sarah mentioned that are suffering, you know, we put those prayers into action ourselves. We can't just pat them on the back and say, well, we hope your prayers are answered. What should our response be if our prayers don't seem to be answered? Simple, keep praying. Um, we've got examples in the Psalms of people um, who felt that God just wasn't listening to them, that he turned his back on them, but they didn't give up. Just keep on praying. You've got Jesus's parable of um, the widow who had some kind of complaint or grievance and she kept going to the judge and eventually he gave her what she wanted and God is so much greater than um, a human unjust judge and his His parable was to encourage us to keep praying and not to give up. You know, I think also of um, the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was desperately ill. And Jesus seemed to be ignoring her, but she didn't give up. Um, So, yeah, that would be my quick response. Don't give up. Keep praying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that um, passage, Sarah, is very important. Um, Men always always ought to pray and not to lose heart, I think Jesus says, isn't it? Um, But but to go back to your original question, Steve, uh, what should our response be if prayers don't seem to be answered? Um, I think the, the question, in a way, that we need to ask is... Are we guilty of actually, in that sense, domesticating God, of thinking that God's ways are always pleasant and predictable? Um, God is not pretty. God is the sublime, and he overawes us with his ways. And, And if anyone wants to quibble with that, we are in the middle of this crisis at the moment. Tim has mentioned Isaiah, and I'm glad he's mentioned that because I'm thinking a lot about that at the moment. You know, you had, I don't know how many thousands of people shut up in Jerusalem with the Assyrians outside. And, you know, those events happened because God used them. So, you know, so God is um, in that sense sublime. Um, But we shouldn't lose faith. We shouldn't lose heart if our prayers are not apparently answered. God may well be answering our prayers, but in ways that we don't, Mm. we don't understand. I think that sometimes our prayers also, um, our expectation is we look at other people and we somehow think that because God has worked in that person's life, why is he not doing that in my life? Um, forgetting that, you know, we're all different and God does not have a um, the same will for every life. God tailor makes um, the will for each one of us. And, and Romans 12 indicates that um, when it talks about the, the, the perfect and complete um, will of God. And one of the Greek words there means tailor-made will, that God will not answer your prayers in the same way, same prayer um, for you and for me. We're in different situations, we're different sizes, we don't all wear the same shirts, we're, we're in totally different situations. But I feel frustrated because God has given you something, children, and he hasn't given me children or whatever it might be that, that is eating into us. I appreciate that comparative element because that's what we're doing right now um, globally. You know, I'm sitting in Canada and we've got lots of space to self-distance ourselves in, but um, that's what we're doing. We look at India and say, oh my, uh, that's what they're doing. And uh, the comparative lens to being critical as opposed to instructive. Over the years, my um, my views on chair uh, on prayer have changed uh, substantially. Um, I used to kind of think that you know the, the one of the main purposes of prayer was to bend God's will to yours, mm-hmm. um, and uh, kind of come to believe now that uh, really the main purpose of prayer is to align your will with God's. Um, and um, if you pray at the end of your prayer, as, as a lot of us do, Thy will be done. Um, then, then his will is always done, you know, because you've said it, God, I, you know, and so that's kind of the, the mindset I have and, and my prayers kind of reflect that nowadays is I very seldom try to tell God what to do and, and try, excuse me, try to, um, say, God, you know, what do you want me to learn from this? How do you want me to respond? How do you want me to be more like you in whatever circumstances I'm going through mm-hmm. rather than giving him a prescription for a solution? Aren't we hugely grateful that God has not answered prayers? I can think of many prayers that I prayed in the past, and I think, thank you, God, for not answering, <laughs> not giving me what I asked for, mm. because you know 
I ask for things that I think will be bread, but God knows it's going to be a stone around my neck. He, he mm-hmm. won't give it. He knows certainly. Mm-hmm. He says, look, as parents, you know to some extent what to give your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father know what's the right thing? And so many things that God has said, no, no, no. And I'm so grateful that he did. One of the verses that I find very, very comforting in times like this is uh, in the 23rd Psalm where it says, um, Yea, through I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And this kind of goes ties into the prayer thing. You know, he never promises us that we're not going to go through the valley of the shadow of death. He just says that when you go, I will be with you. And so, you know, I try to reflect that hopefully in my prayers that, um, you know, not to say, don't take me in the valley of the shadow of death. If I need to go, um, you know, I'll put myself in your hands. And if I need to go, then then I'll just hopefully give me the faith to realize you're there with me when I'm going through this and um, I will be done, you know. Mm-hmm. So in this global challenge, then how do we respond by saying we will also be with you? Right. You know, like God will be with yeah. us and, yeah. and how will we be with him? Again, still focusing on that avoiding passivity, God's with us, but But, how are we with him? And what do we do? Anna is in a hospital. What are we doing to be with him? I'm not providing answers. That's just a question. (laughs) One of my theories that I've been working on is that if we don't show any interest and don't, we make prayers for people, whatever, if we can't just go buy a card or we can't send them an email you know, after this prayer, please help so-and-so, whatever. If we can't even do the least little part, why should God care? You know, and he maybe looks at it and says, you're not doing anything. But if we do, if we get involved in the things we pray for, I don't know, it seems to me that then God takes more of an interest. Is that a crazy way to look at things? It might, you know, say, okay, yeah, you're actually, you sent a card or you cared about this person, you called them up or you got involved, you went and joined a food pantry. You, I don't know, that the things that we pray for, we should actually do something about. Well, we're called to be here to us. That they matter we're to called us. to be a community and, you know, your community is now quite a bit shorter. I don't have to walk very many feet to get to someone who's in my community that I must, I must help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and so, yes, rather than shelter in place completely, we have to shelter in place with those whom we can help. And that's anyone that's not just in our ecclesia, which we can't get to because it's 40 minutes away. Uh, But that's in our literal family, our literal neighborhood, our literal neighbors must be someone that we reach out to. And yes, I guess toilet paper more than flowers, but <laughs> seems to be the issue. But, but that, that's what scripture says, isn't it? Um, Galatians 6 verse 10, um, as you have opportunity, do good to all men yes. um, and especially to the house of the faith. So this is an opportunity where um, you know, we, we can um, show the face of Christ and say, well, I'm doing unto others as I would wish they would do to me. This mm-hmm. is what Christ is teaching. Let me throw another question out, uh, a little bit of a change of direction. I've been to so many Bible schools growing up, uh, hearing so many prophecy lectures in the 1900s, you know, 1980s, uh, that this here are the numbers, here's how they add up. And here's when Jesus is coming back, and it was well before the year 2000, for many of those. Um, I'm just curious, you know, is this, is it bad to consider that the, that just talk that way, that these are the last days and Jesus is just around the corner? I don't think it helps because we don't know. As I, I deliberately at the beginning talked about 1918 and 50 million people dying. Um, you know, there, there's been far worse pandemics um, going on. So, yes, we know that we're closer to the return of Jesus than we were yesterday. But when that will be, we trust our God it will be at the right time. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that's and, and, and Tim, you brought up a great time for this, you know, in that in that period of 1914 to 1918. Look at all the things we saw. We had the first worldwide war, World War One. We had um, the uh, uh, Jerusalem and Israel came back into uh, uh, taken from the Ottoman Empire. And um, um, we had this huge flu epidemic. And, and I'm certainly uh, that I'm sure that got people and a lot of people very certain that this, in fact, was the, the second coming. You know, but it, 
it just didn't pan out. So we have to be careful about that. I think about being too dogmatic in these in these predictions. Because you like like you, Steve. I I grew up in a an environment where you know every other year there was some you know uh, prediction that, that you know this is the year. This is the year, mm-hmm. and and and, and it, it does harm people. Some people because they you know they go wow they're they keep missing it and keep misspeaking so that you know I can't trust anything they say these you know these people so I think just think we have to be careful. I'm thinking in particular young people who pay attention to that kind of thing who aren't baptized yet let's say and are trying to decide whether to stay as part of the community or not and then when these things that's what I mean by counterproductive it's like yeah oh goodness you know here we go again. Yeah I. I- I agree with what folks have said. It's not helpful at all. And I guess we've all heard those verses from Luke 21 quoted. There'll be great earthquakes in various places, famines and plagues and so on, pestilences. Well, that's been the case for the past um, 2,000 years. And we seem to quote these verses every, every time something major happens, people fainting for fear of what's coming upon the world. And it is unhelpful. Um, there was an editorial in November 2019 in the Christadelphian Tidings, and uh, the editor quoted Harry Tennant, who said, um, how is the interested friend to trust our setting forth of first principles if our dogmatism on unproved theories collapses with the passing of time, let's keep sound doctrine and personal peeps into the future quite separate. Um, so, yeah, it is counterproductive to be um, talking that, you know, Christ is on the doorstep. He's been on the doorstep the past 2,000 years. Mm. Mm-hmm. And in truth, Christ is risen. The kingdom is now put into practice. The kingdom now, um, Christ is alive. Uh, so the idea of where he is geographically, you know, is not for us to uh, bother with, except to be functionally in this kingdom now. Um, what are we waiting for? I guess I keep coming back to passivity. <laughs> what are we sitting around for? You yeah, know, there's much to be gained. Spot on, Janice. I think, you know, we've got to remember that Matthew chapter 25 is also part of the Olivet Prophecy. And now you've got the three parables about, well, what are we waiting for? What should we be doing? What does watching for Christ's return actually look like? Well, it looks like feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, clothing the naked and welcoming strangers. You know, um, the Lord wants us to be ambassadors of his kingdom in our community, and he wants us to be Christ to the people around us who've never seen him or heard his voice. And he wants us to show compassion to people who don't deserve it, but so desperately need it anyway, just like us. So, uh, yeah, that is what we should be doing, and that is how to watch. I've I've always been very concerned about the way that Christadelphians use Bible prophecy. Mm. Just a couple of points. Um, first of all, what do we mean by the last days? Um, I mean, in one sense, you could argue, yes, we are in the last days because we are living at a time when the state of Israel exists. That's got nothing to do with COVID-19. Um, the fact that the Jews are back in their land means that a lot of those ancient Bible prophecies have become switched back on again. But that's a separate point from what we're seeing at the moment. So so let's just park that on one side. Um, yeah, I have been concerned about the, the misuse of um, Bible prophecy by our community. Um, and it seems to be endemic. And to pick up your point, Sarah, um, you know, if, if um, as Brother Harry Tennant says, you know, if, if, if we're seen to be less than honest um, about the way that we talk about prophecy, then why should people listen to anything else that we say? And the thing that really irritates me is the, um, let me be polite about it, the nonsense that we've had in the UK over um, the Brexit and the way that there's been conflating that uh, with Bible prophecy. It's got absolutely nothing to do with Scripture. You know, and, and I think to myself, are we really serious as a community of Bible students if we can make such tenuous links between some obscure passage in the book of Isaiah and what's going on in Britain? There's more evidence for India being Tarshish than there is for Britain. I mean, it's just nonsense. Um, and Jesus made it absolutely clear in Luke that the coming of the kingdom cannot be anticipated by signs. 
and that when he does return, we will all be caught napping, because that's what the parable of the ten virgins is about. Just to Karam's point, I think it's really interesting, you know, whenever there's conflict, you know, it's, oh, it's wars and rumors of wars, Christ is coming. And then if, uh, um, you know, if there's peace or whatever, they go, oh, you know, they quote the verses about peace and everything. Or if there's nothing going on, it's, oh, it's as in the days of Noah. So, you know, anything that's going on in the world can be used as a sign that Christ is 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 coming. So we, again, just, we just be very careful about doing, doing that sort of thing, you know. I think if I can, now that we're on my hobby horse, um, <laughs> um, my concern, and it's, become, it's come to me sort of over the years, that as a community, we see our salvation in terms of the kingdom. We don't see our salvation in terms of Christ himself. And I think that that is, a, is actually quite a fundamental error. Um, I've even heard strange baptismal formulas which put the kingdom of God before Christ himself. Um, you know, salvation is through Christ. You know, it's not through the kingdom. It's through the person of Jesus himself. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's just go around the, the loop here, around the globe. We almost circumnavigated the globe with, with you guys in your different places. Not, not quite. Um, but uh, just a, a last thought, a parting thought on uh, what we've been talking about, about faith through the pandemic. Oh, starting with India in the East. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, when you say in one of the questions here, any way you can view it positively, um, getting back to my Ecclesiastes um, studies, um, Ecclesiastes 1.13, that God gives things in our lives um, to be exercised by it, that, that this life um, is there are many things that God brings in this life which are not easy, but we know that if we go to a gymnasium, we're not going to get fit by lifting bits of paper up and down for five minutes. We're going to get fit because we've got heavy weights that make us sweat and struggle and groan. We're going to get strong. So God, to make us spiritually strong, is not going to give us a you know flower be decked path all the way to the kingdom. He's going to bring these things. And Jesus himself, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So so, yes, there is benefit if we make use of it. We, we don't enjoy it, otherwise it wouldn't be suffering. We, we don't want it. We don't enjoy it. But um, to those who are exercised by it, 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 it brings improvement in our spiritual position before the Father. I think one of the things that's interesting is that going back to this thing that we, we place value on, um, you know, we've had a, um, an industrialised global civilization now for a couple of hundred years and productivity is the thing that seemed to be the most important thing. Um, and one of the things that, that the pandemic is doing, I think we touched on this already in some way, that it's making people spend time with themselves, with their families together. Somebody said it at Eric I thought it was a very good thing. We are human beings. We are not human doings, you know. And just learning to be still and learning to be present um, in the presence of God um, is something maybe that will come out of this. When um, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people went into exile, um, at the end of the, um, the book of Kings and Jeremiah, I think it says that, you know, so that the land would enjoy its Sabbaths. Even the earth is owed its Sabbaths. And maybe, you know, because we're seeing that one of the effects of all of this, this, you know, the fact we're not dashing around all over the place, is that pollution levels are going down. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so that all of that is interesting. Um, Perhaps we will learn to place value on different things as a result of this. I hope so. I wind up that um, everybody around us in our community here, nobody has been affected by the actual coronavirus. We have about 10 cases in a city of 10 million. Um, so I don't know anybody who's, who's been connected with it. So just talking, you can talk unemotionally in a sense. And I tend to say to some of my neighbours here, look, this is not a pandemic. Pan means all, and demic means people, all the people. All the people are not affected by this. But there is a pandemic called sin. Sin is a pandemic because it's everybody suffers from sin. Mm. Therefore, let's look, um, is there any way that our creator has provided a solution for the pandemic of sin? And it's a good talking point. If you're talking to somebody who's got no emotional sort of yeah. problem with, with the event. 
So I, I quoted earlier the um, 23rd Psalm where it says, uh, talks about the valley of the shadow of death, but it, it follows that verse up with, uh, says thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And um, I, and, and looking at that, um, usually the, you know, the, the, the rod is, is normally associated with correction or, uh, you know, punishment or, or, or some sort of uh, bad thing in the Bible. And, and, and the staff is that little crooked, Thing that they use to the shepherds use to pull the uh, animal out of the ditch when they get stuck, and so th- those two things together to me kind of represent you know God's uh, correction and God's blessings. And uh, but the interesting thing in that psalm, it's both of those comfort David in the psalm. You know, the rod and the staff they comfort him. And and again, I go back to the point about you know. If we really trust God, if we really believe in Him, if we really believe He is who He says He is, um, there's a, a, a lot of comfort that comes to us from believing that and just having the faith that God knows what He's doing. You know, there's so many books in the Bible that that, that deal with the issue of, uh, of of theodicy, which is is um, if God is all good, um, you know, why does evil exist and and all loving? And um, you know, Job deals with it, uh, Habakkuk deals with it. There's a lot of books that deal with this subject, but they basically kind of all te- send a, uh, tend to come back to this key point, which is God is in control. He knows what he's doing. We have a role to play, and it's not running the universe. Um, that's his job, and we need to let him do his job. And we have a very finite um, uh, portion in that, and, and that's to love God, believe in God, obey God, um, and, and try to share the love of God with other people. And, and we can do that in this pandemic as much, if not more, than any other time um, in, in the history of this world. So that's my parting thought. I want to respond a little bit to what Kyle spoke earlier about anger, because I recognize some people don't have the virus in their community as much as other communities, but we're all virused, if that could be a verb. Uh, And I do think we have to use our voices and our action. We talk about getting involved in politics, and I do think that if we can take it back to the original meaning of politic, uh, which is to show prudence, to um, show um, sensibility, if you will, in how we voice our um, concern about what's happening. Um, I could look in India and say, oh my, they're hitting people, oh dear. Uh, But we have much to learn from how each group of uh, people, each government uh, chooses to organize a response and speak up when we can, I guess, insert the compassion of Jesus, insert our voices to uh, direct things where possible, uh, even in the smallest of ways. Uh, I think, um, well, uh, Chris Hadfield said uh, on, he's a Canadian uh, uh, astronaut, he said when he was on the spaceship, uh, he said that to avoid fear or the cure for fear is to um, develop competency, uh, to again find competency so that you can be involved in reverting people's fears, to uh, settle people's fears. And so I think voice with compassion and with our own personal comp- competencies, as Anna is doing in uh, hospitals or what, what we can do in our families or in our a small groups, I think, is essential to put into action. We can't just have passive voices because we're waiting for Jesus to come back. Waiting for him to come and fix it all. Perhaps I'd just like to finish by building on what Janice just said. Um, she touched on the question, how politically involved should believers get? And um, in our community, politics is is often a, a dirty word and we shouldn't get involved at all, but forget the word. It, it's an issue of vocabulary again. And let's just look at everything through the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ and his teaching. The two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbour as yourself. Um, and the golden rule as well that Jesus articulated in everything do to others as you would have them do to you for this is the law and the prophets now if we view this situation the pandemic through that lens we can't be passive can we because love 
isn't passive. Um, doing unto others as you would have them do to you isn't passive. It's sort of reaching out and looking um, at, at people's needs, how to care for our community. One of those ways of caring it is to social distance, um, to keep ourselves from disease so that health services are free to tackle the problems. Other ways of um, reaching out, you know, we've all got neighbours, as we've said, just to make sure that they've all got um, groceries, especially if they're elder, elderly and not able to get out. But yeah, forget the word political and just put on those um, glasses of, of looking at this situation through the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and his teaching of love. Terrific. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion, at least from my point of view. I hope you've all uh, enjoyed talking with each other uh, as much as I have. Um, but uh, let's continue our prayers. We heard that in one, one of the things that we talked about. Uh, no matter what, that God is there. God is present. God and Jesus present. And whether we see a result immediately or not, that's not the point. The point is our growth uh, and uh, con continuing in the faith that we have and helping others as we've just concluded uh, here talking about. Go ahead. You can all say goodbye to each other. Because <laughs> I'm well, not going to put this in. Bye. 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 I think we can this. learn so much from each other just because every group handles things so differently. So I think it's important to keep learning from the global picture because the kingdom is global. There are probably a lot of ideas that people have about things that can be done that are that show the love of Christ that we really haven't thought about.